a couple years ago when I was like hotshot Hollywood Max Landis, I like went around trying to get the rights for Jason, Freddie and Chucky. And the guy, I think his name is like Walter, but the guy in charge of the Freddie rights hated me personally and thought I was annoying. So he wouldn't meet with me, but I had this crazy, awesome, epic movie called Hellbound that I wanted to pitch them where you take all of the 80s horror icons and put them in a movie as the Avengers, as the main characters. I had the setup basically like Wizard of Oz, but going into hell, it was really great. And it was a really fun thing. My pitch that kept like getting people on board was I always said, you're never gonna have a $100 million opening weekend with a Jason movie. You're never gonna have a $100 million opening weekend with a Freddy movie. And you're never gonna have even an $80 million weekend with Chucky. It's just not gonna happen. But if they're all on the same poster, it's a $100 million opening weekend. You do it as an adventure action movie with gore elements, get big creators like Del Toro involved, really have like a visually inventive epic movie featuring those characters because they're not scary anymore. We're in the Blumhouse era and we're also in the art horror era where the things that scare us, it, it isn't a doll or a, but even Annabelle doesn't move because modern audiences would be like, the doll's moving, that's dumb. You know, Chucky is almost like a Black Mirror movie. These, what the remake is, I wanted to do like an authentic thing about these characters. Let us root for Freddy. Let us root for Jason. We already are rooting for them. Why not just commit? And it was so funny because I was really hot as a screenwriter at the time. And I got so, 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 so close on this. But that guy just hated me. That dude hated me. And so I never even got to pitch him. And I'm sure he, I'm sure he hated me for a good reason. I'm sure I was obnoxious to him as, at a party or something. I, I was a real uh, snot-nosed punk for uh, a number of years. You know, not 100% of the time, but sometimes and to the wrong people. I'll tell you about the protagonist because I really love him. His name is Clive. Clive is a black kid. He's 17. He's in the foster care system and he has a real aggression problem. Like, not good. He has like a rage problem. Like when he loses it, he loses it. And he's been bounced from foster care to foster care. He hasn't been able to find parents. Now he has this 16 year old drug addict girlfriend in the foster home. She's like the biggest problem in the foster home, but he's actually been on good behavior for like six months. And he's met this wonderful family. I think like young John Boyega, like attack the block John Boyega. Like that's who it is in my head. But this family really loves him. And he's so excited because he's going to get adopted. He hasn't had an incident in a fucking year. The people at the foster home are like nervous about him because he's associating with, uh, let's call her Liv. But this girl Liv is like a problem. She's an addict. She's dangerous. She's borderline personality disorder. And But you know what? It looks like he's going to get out. So he goes to meet with the parents. They're fucking awesome. We love them. It's like Steve Zahn and Gina Davis. Like it's, it's, they're fucking wonderful. He loves them. They love him. They have a job for him at their store. You know, our dude Clive, he's like, this is my moment. The thing is on the night that he is supposed to be picked up by them, their mother, Steve Zahn's mom has a medical emergency. So the adoption has to wait a week, but that bed at the foster home is actually being filled that night which means Clive, our main character, is getting bounced from his foster home to a local parent home who like take foster kids in. So he's like, oh, fuck, okay. So he has to go stay with total strangers. He gets sent to this nice house on a nice street. And you know what? These people are nice. These people seem cool. Let's call them the Smiths. Like they, they seem like really nice and they're clearly like, we're sorry, you have to be here. And then fucking Liv, his drug addict girlfriend, comes sneaking in the window. And she's like, you're going to leave me? And he's like, no, I'm getting adopted. You can't sneak. Does this mean you broke out? They get caught by Mr. Smith. They're brought downstairs. Mr. Smith's like, what are we going to do? Do we call the place? Clive is like, please, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Please, 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 please. Please, please, please don't call the place because then I won't get adopted by Steve Zahn and Gina Davis. Like, please, please, please. And they, Mr. Smith goes, okay, okay, I see what's happening. Um, sure, 
I'll, I'll do it if you can solve this puzzle. And he takes out a cube that looks very familiar. That's the puzzle box from Hellraiser. He hands it to Clive and Liv is sitting there and she goes, are you serious? What is this, some sort of sick Saw movie? You're making him solve a Rubik's cube or you're gonna sabotage his adoption? Clive is like, yo, Liv, shut the fuck up. You have sabotaged my adoption. I am going to solve this Rubik's cube. Click. If you've seen Hellraiser, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, allow me to describe an ornate cube that uh, moves and twists and seems sinister, but it can't really be described how. What does this cube mean? You'll see later in the pitch. So Mr. Smith takes back the cube and he goes, interesting. And Clive goes, yeah, it was easy. Mr. Smith goes, okay. And he serves Clive and Liv dinner. He says, Liv, you can leave. Miss Smith bids Liv out. Liv is like on coke and like crazy. So she kind of sneaks back around the house and she's like, no, no, those people are weird. There's something weird going on. They're not weird, by the way. They seem perfectly nice to anyone who hasn't seen a Hellraiser movie. So <laughs> uh, Clive is sitting there and he's at the dinner table. He's finished. He starts to get dizzier, 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 and then goes crashing to the ground. And Mr. and Mrs. Smith start to bring him upstairs, but Liv sees what happens because she's on coke and paranoid and she calls 911. So an ambulance comes, gets Clive. Clive's in a fucking coma. He's vomiting on himself. He's shaking. They take him and the ambulance leaves and we pass the sign, Elm Street. In the hospital, the Smiths isolate Clive and they keep trying to get into the room, but he's in a coma and can't wake up. Or at least his physical body can't. Deep inside the dreamscape, Clive awakens on Elm Street. One, two, Freddy's coming for you. Freddy Krueger attacks and tortures and kills Clive. But Clive doesn't die. Freddy again tries to kill Clive, slashing him apart. The wounds are horrific. The pain is intense. But Clive simply heals. The third time Freddy attacks, Clive fucking loses it. This kid has had a rage problem for a long time. He attacks and pummels Freddy, beating the shit out of him and eventually stabbing him with his own claws. C Freddy barely manages to overpower Clive and rips his face off. And his face grows back. Freddy is like, what the fuck is happening? Clive is like, where am I? What's going on? Out in the hospital, more and more of the Smiths Friends from Elm Street are arriving. Nice white folks from a good neighborhood. Interesting. Interesting. Liv has broken into the hospital. She's convinced a cult is trying to kill her boyfriend. That doesn't go over well with the hospital guards, but she kicks one in the balls and gets away. By the way, I should mention at this point that despite Liv being in a place where she's coming down from cocaine, her boyfriend has been kidnapped by a cult. He is correct. She is exactly correct about what is happening. Meanwhile, in the dreamscape, Freddy, after repeatedly trying to kill Clive, has it revealed to him that Clive, on his body, has the puzzle box he solved. Freddy doesn't know what it is. However, when Freddy touches it, briefly, his burns heal, and Freddy has a shock as he's turned into Fred Krueger. Just for a moment, and then the claws come back out and the burns go back on. Freddy, startled, says he feels like he remembered something from his life. Clive is like, who the fuck are you? You're a murderer in dreams? And that's the point when Freddy realizes he doesn't know. For the last nearly 50 years, Freddy Krueger has been killing teens in their sleep. But he doesn't know how, and he doesn't know why, and when they're not dreaming, he's not conscious. In fact, the fact that he couldn't kill Clive has meant that this is the longest contiguous period of consciousness he has had since his death, which is about three hours. Usually Freddy has 15 minute blips in and out of dreams. And no one has asked him, who are you and why are you here? Clive is like, who are you, what are you, and why are you here? 
when Freddie realizes he doesn't know, he wants to touch the cube again. But now Clive's like, no, 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 no. You can touch the cube again if you get me out of this place. Freddie's like, I don't know how to get you out of this place. I don't know what this place is. Not dialogue we've heard. I'd want like a really good actor for Freddie. It couldn't be England. He's too old. But someone really, really cool, you know, like who could do the switch from like the j sexual jokes and being a prick to being like really freaked out because the fun of this part of the movie is you watch Freddy try to untangle the lore of Freddy Krueger and he can't. So here we go. Our dude gets the cube, spins it, and then Freddy, who wants to touch it, tries to touch it and it tears open the world, revealing an endless fiery drop beneath them. But then this sort of glimmering Lovecraftian mist that goes off that way. Clive is like, bye, I'm going that way. Freddy is like, hey, kid, 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 wait. You're telling me you can get me out of here? And Clive is like, I don't fucking know you creepy old white man. I really am not interested in your bullshit, okay? Freddy's like, no, 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 I can help you. I can help you. I know all about hell. I've been sent to hell before. If that's a way out, you have to take me. He doesn't do it so desperately. I'm just a bad actor. It's more like, if that's a way out, you have to take me. You know, good dialogue. I'm good at dialogue. Sometimes when I write, just trust, I would like do okay at the dialogue. So they go into the mist. Meanwhile, in the hospital, the cult is like in force and they are starting to sort of like block off the lowest floor. So all the doctors and nurses in the hospital are going around going, sir, you're not supposed to, sir. A lot of little incidences like that, except for there's more and more of them. And Liv is like, these people are a cult. She's right, but it doesn't go over well with the hospital guard, especially since she already kicked him in the nuts. And she's like, you need to lock down the hospital before it gets any worse. They're trying to kill my boyfriend. The dude cuffs her. And that's when something appears behind him. A shape of a man. You might recognize him by his mask. Michael Myers slits the guard's throat. Liv is cuffed to a thing. She's like, ah! Michael Myers goes to kill her. She manages to break the thing and stabs Michael Myers through the chest. He falls backwards, slashing at her. Liv runs out into the hospital, but the hospital is on lockdown. That's right. This is no longer an epic adventure movie through hell. It's also a classic 80s slasher movie a la Halloween 2 set in a hospital starring Michael Myers. I give gifts to you because I love you. Out of the mist in hell comes Clive and Freddy. Except for as they exit, they realize... They're not in hell. They're in some sort of Stygian Midgard territory, a space between spaces, a uh, bardo, if you will. Sounds like there's a party going on down that way. So they head down that way and see a sign that says, welcome to Camp Crystal Lake, a moonlit party with naked models, teenagers everywhere. It is an orgy. They're smoking weed. They're getting drunk. The kids are nowhere in sight. Oh, wait, there's a kid. He's hanging from a tree. There's a kid. He's impaled to a door. As they walk in, Freddie and Clive see every single dead body from every Friday the 13th at Crystal Lake. They walk through the crime scenes as though it happened moments ago, but there's still just this big party going on. The counselors act like Freddie, even though he's... Freddy Krueger is a totally normal guy. They're like, hey, sexy, come party. Do you like smoking weed? Freddy is like, something's wrong with this place. I've been here before. I've been here before. We got to get out of here. By the way, if, if you didn't understand how Michael Myers appeared from nowhere, maybe you should ask about those black thorn tattoos on the wrists of the parents from Elm Street. That's right. Halloween 4. Paul Rudd. Halloween 5. Curse of Michael Myers. I'm doing the cult thing. They never paid it off in the Halloween movie, so we're paying it off here. And we're paying it off seamlessly for people who've never seen the terrible Halloween sequels by introducing this cult as the cult that controls not only Michael Myers, but also Freddy Krueger. We'll get into that in a second because we're linking the entire mythology seamlessly with pieces that were already there. We're not rebooting anything. Here we go. 
Camp Crystal Lake's a popping party, but Clive sees out in the water, way, way, way far, far out there, drowning as a little boy. He's just drowning. He drowns for hours on end as the counselor's party. He's just stuck there, dying. Clive gets sort of drawn into the partying. It's like one of those old scenes from like, you know, Greek mythology where the women, you know, seduce the men by looking at them, be you, be you, be you, you know, like, uh oh, I guess I do want to party. Freddie is like, this is maybe, I was wrong about Camp Crystal Lake. Like, this is sick. He puts on a Camp Crystal Lake t-shirt, of course, so we can sell merch of Freddie in the Camp Crystal Lake t-shirt, be serious. And he puts on the baseball cap. He's like, kid, come on, let's just party, why not? Clive is like, no, this is wrong. There's that boy drowning. Clive runs, jumps off the dock, swims deeper and deeper and deeper into the lake, comes to the boy. He's deformed and misshapen. The boy's screaming. He wraps his arms around Clive. Clive gets pull, pulls the boy back into shore. Meanwhile, Freddie's partying with the counselors, but all the counselors stop partying. In fact, they're all now staring at Freddie and their faces seem long and distended. They're all standing on the shore as our hero Clive pulls young Jason Voorhees, choking, choking, Clive goes, fuck this shit, and gives him CPR. Being a lifeguard was one of the things he had to do for his community service. He saves Jason before he drowns. Jason sits up, shaking. Freddy sees Jason and goes, oh, and then turns out of the counselors. He's not scared anymore, he goes, Wow, you're all fucked now, goes shting like that. And then behind him, this little kid hulks into eight foot tall Jason Voorhees. Machete, hockey mask, let's go. Freddy and Jason versus the demonic counselors. It's fucking awesome. Except for midway through the fight, one of the counselors reaches and touches the cube that Clive is trying to keep away. By touching the cube, instantaneously, white skin, metal bolts, they become a Cenobite. They wipe out all the counselors, but then it's Clive versus the Cenobite. And this thing has fucking spawn chains, CGI chains whipping all over the place, practical chains hitting stuntmen, Jason and Freddy fucking fighting like they're in a fucking Marvel movie. This is where they need to be. This is where the characters deserve to be. They don't deserve to be in shitty remakes. Sorry. I'm passionate with that hot chicken, that beer, and that weed. I'm passionate about this. Back in the hospital, Liv tries to call the police and gets through. And guess what? There have already been multiple police calls from the hospital. This cult is not doing this smoothly. But the hospital's quarantine lockdown procedures are initiated. The police can't get in, even though they're surrounding the building. Liv realizes if someone's going to save Clive... She's going to have to do it herself. She still has this fucking bar cuffed to her. So she wraps the chain around her arm, sticks the bar in there, locks it off. Freddie, Clive, and Jason defeat the Cenobite. Jason has now entered the party, and he's basically Chewbacca. Like, that's literally the character. The best thing about Jason is that he can go into big mode, but most of the time the character is in little boy camp mode because i always found that in that version of jason interesting i never really felt like we explored it i was always really really curious to know what he was like so now he's hanging with the gang but freddie and jason are just at each other's throats even though jason is just sort of like mm, 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 you know like that but freddie will say something and jason will go mm, like that and freddie will go don't condescend to me. You know, it's like that. It's like the classic vibe of that type of pairing. So out they go, but the Cenobite is still pursuing them. They use the cube, the lament configuration, to tear another hole in reality and escape through that. The Cenobite can't be killed by Freddy and Jason. No matter how many times they try to kill it, this thing just keeps coming. And what it does to you isn't kill you. You can't die in hell. What it does to you is wrap you in chains and tries to take you away. Where is it taking you? What do the Cenobites want to do to you? Well, we'll find out soon. Hang on. Jesus, come on. So through the mists again, this time the Cenobite derails them. They end up in an endless parking lot. In the parking lot for the first time, Freddy basically says, explains what's happening to Jason. This kid has a box that can get us out of hell. Little Jason is like, 
I'm not in hell. Yes, you are, kid. No, what did I do wrong? You killed about 400 people. I don't think I would do that. Yeah, but you did, though. Were they all bad people? No, they were children. Are you crying? So Freddie and Jason have a uh, difficult relationship. At the edge of the parking lot is a steel gate. Freddie is like, getting out of hell can't be this easy, right? The kid's like, I don't know. But guarding the gate is an old man. The old man stares at Clive. Clive stares at the old man. This is the old man Clive beat up three years ago when he was 14. He was a security guard at a mall. Now he's a guard in hell. Clive is like, will you let us through? The old man is like, you're trying to leave? Clive, do you think you're here by mistake? Do you think those people up there could send someone to hell? Do you think they're that powerful? Or do you think they just rushed you along to where you was already going? I died in my sleep of a stroke. They said it was natural, but the devil told me it was because of that hit you gave to my head. So in the moment that you would think that he's going to be like, I'm so sorry. He goes, hey, fuck you, old man. You think you're in hell by accident? I you fool me? What the fuck did you do? I just fucking punched you. What the fuck did you do? You had a whole life to live and you still ended up in hell. Fuck you, old man. And Clive beats the shit out of the guard again. He's not your normal protagonist. I want to have fun with him. You know, I want to like, whoa, damn. Jason and Freddie are like, fuck. That was really intense. So they bust through the gate. They're going to leave hell and they realize... They haven't left hell. At the end of this parking lot was a factory. It's the good guy doll factory from Child's Play 2. And from inside, they can hear someone screaming, help, help me, help. Freddie, Jason, and Chucky had realized the only way through is through the factory. It extends infinitely in either direction. So they have to fucking go directly through the front doors. Freddie's like, Listen, we can't stop and help people everywhere we go. This isn't a rescue mission. We need to get out of here before another one of those Cenobite things finds us. Jason is like, Ooh, mm, someone want help. Clive is like, look, we need all the help we can get. If someone doesn't want to be here, we're on their side. Get it straight. They go into the good guy doll factory and everywhere are humans with doll eyes that are assembling Chucky dolls. They're assembling good guy dolls, left, right, left, right, left, right. And they're assembling every version from every version of Child's Play. So every single different model of the doll is represented on the assembly line. Dangling above everything is our Chucky design, which is going to be really close to the one in Child's Play 2, uh, which is the best one. The bride design is great, but like Child's Play 2 is the one that rides the line between being really expressive and being really horrifying to look at. So... Chucky's up there. Help me! Help me! Clive is like, they got a little kid up there. Freddy's like, that's not a kid. It's one of these dolls. Jason's like, mm, he's small. You need help. Clive's like, let's fucking get him down. Freddy's like, please, don't. He's clearly evil. This is a hell for him. Don't be a fucking fool. Clive is like, no, uh, excuse me. I am a fucking fool. Fuck you. I'm going to get the doll down incredible three-tiered action sequence where Jason, Freddy, and have to fight all these doll people. Fucking awesome. And again, a new Cenobite made of Chucky dolls. Again, I'm thinking about the merchandise here, people. I'm thinking about the toys. <laughs> I want to sell people the Chucky ball statue, Chucky Cenobite statuette. We haven't gotten to the most merchandisable sellout Ready Player One moment of this pitch yet, by the way. that You'll know that when it comes. Okay, so here we go. I'm excited. Okay, so here we go. So Clive manages to get Chucky down. Chucky is like, my name is Charles Lee Ray. I was falsely accused of the murder of seven people. And then I was trapped in the body of a doll. Freddy is like, if you're falsely accused, what are you doing here? Chucky is like, 
You guys seem like nice people. Please. I'm an innocent soul. Voodoo was done to me by a, you know, a black guy. Clive is like, I'm black. Chucky's like, no, you know how it is. Clive's like, what's that mean? Chucky's like, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how it is. Just please help. Freddie's like, yo, this guy's racist. <laughs> like, Chucky is like, I, he's kind of like uh, DeVito from Always Sunny is sort of how I picture Chucky. D nice Chucky. Chucky pretending to be nice is like he's bad at it. So he's like, please, kid, I know how to get out of here. I know how to get out of hell. I know voodoo magic. I can get you to the deeper layer. And they're like, why didn't you get yourself to the deeper layer? He's like, you think I haven't tried that? You think I ended up in the factory on accident? No, man. I've been back and forth to the real world many, many times. And I can smell it on this guy, too. The big mentally different guy. Is that he's mentally different? Jason's like, fuck you. Chucky's like, fuck you. I love this movie. Uh, so Chucky's like, I can get you to the lower level of hell where they judge people. Every time I've tried to go, they catch me and send me back up. And they're like, who catches you? Who runs hell? He's like, devils, demons, you know, the fucking things, the fucking red guys, they're monsters. It's all fire down there. And he's like, really? That's what hell is? Freddy is like, one time worms came out of me. Chucky's like, yeah, shit like that. Freddy is like, I don't know what the worms meant. And Jason kind of goes, oh, I, I turned into a worm. Clive goes, you turned into a worm. And Freddy goes, ignore him, please. Chucky's like, thank you. See, he's different. By the way, uh, so many of these are like deep cut in jokes for big fans of this, of these series. Like Jason did turn into a worm. That's an actual thing that happened in the Friday the 13th movies. Okay, sorry. Uh, but it would be like a throwaway joke in this movie. And if you get it, you get it. And if not, it's just Jason going, I turned into a worm and it's cute. So like, there would be a lot of that in the dialogue. You know, I, I'm not going to do like outright fan service because I want to fold it in. I was like to fold in. Fold in. Okay, here we go. So Chucky goes, Are they give me the power I beg of you and brings them a level lower into hell. And it's like Greek hell. It's fire and demons and all of the things, all the things we've never really seen in a movie, all the shit from Doom, like big fancy hell. Wow. And they just walk right in. All around them are undead people. It's basically like that scene in Hellboy 2, where like the market, like we're now in a full on fantasy movie in hell. Meanwhile, in the hospital, our homegirl Liv uh, watches White. I don't know why I called her our homegirl, just because I like her. I was just being affectionate to my character. She watches as Michael Myers kills his way through the entire hospital. And that's when she realizes something. Everyone here from researching them they're all like couples in their 50s and 60s. They were all parents at one time of a child who died mysteriously or violently while sleeping. What? Liv manages to get to the roof and a few of the other foster kids, her like it, stranger things group, meet up with her because they broke in. They brought knives. They brought a gun. These are not the kids from Stranger Things. They're going to fuck up these fucking cultists. <laughs> they go into the hospital. In hell, we get the payoff to the storyline that we have just been introduced to. As Freddy, Jason, and Chucky have to go through with Clive this area where you are judged. Enter and begin an incredible sequence uh, where we see Clive beat up the old man. We see Chucky kill so many people. We see Jason murder his way through legion upon legion of teenager. And then it gets to Freddy. And an interesting thing happens. So I'm gonna try this and, uh, and see if I can do it. So basically we watch this movie of Freddy's life with Freddy and Clive. We see Freddy, young boy, being raised in the trailer park. His mother's abusive. He tortures cats. He's a little sociopath. His mother rubs his face in a dead cat. And then we see him 
teenager, creepy, never has any friends, lonely and weird. You know, Jackie Earl Haley, Freddy, creepy. He gets a job at the school. He's a janitor at a little school on Elm Street. And he actually really gets along with the kids. He makes them laugh. He starts to have a flirtation with a teacher. His life is kind of like coming together. Missing poster. One of the little kids at Elm Street is missing. The police talk to Freddy Krueger. Police talk to the teacher. The school year continues. Freddy attends the little girl's funeral. He builds this glove. But it's just a glove he uses to clean the inside of the boilers. But more and more missing posters are coming up. The police talk to Freddy again. And again. More funerals. Freddy one day goes to visit one of the little kids goes up to their bedroom. Here's something. He comes in. There's blood on the floor. He goes into the bathroom and he sees her father slitting her throat with the Freddy glove. We're where we know in Freddy's origin story. He's running covered in sweat, chased by the parents of Elm Street, the real killers of the children of Elm Street. He's trapped in the boiler room. He remembers his good times with the teacher. All the faces of the missing kids flashing in front of him as the parents throw in a Molotov and light the boiler room on fire. Freddy frantically tries to use the glove to break the window but can't and burns alive. Clive turns to Freddy. Oh my God, man. You were innocent. They framed you to summon a demon. Freddy is like, no, this is impossible. This doesn't matter. Clive goes, you weren't in hell. You were in the dreamscape. I was the one that brought you to hell. Freddy is like, no, 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 no. Fre Clive is like, You've been murdering for them. You're not a serial killer. You're a hitman. They brainwash you. Freddy is like, holy fucking shit. <laughs> the real killer this whole time has been the parents on Elm Street. They summon Freddy to sacrifice their children for great material wealth on Earth. They are also the Blackthorn cult, the people who created Michael Myers. They are the sat satanic unifying principle of this universe. Pretty cool. I mean, I, I mean, I like it. They arrive in, I think it's called the city of Dis, which is the main city in hell where the devil sits on a flaming throne. Chucky's like, I've never been this far in. It's kind of corny, isn't it? Clive is like, it's hell, man. What's it, corny? You're that jaded? Just because you lied about being a serial killer in a doll's body. Excuse me, I am a, a man in a doll's body. Don't reduce me to a serial killer. Man, technically in hell, you're not in a doll's body. You are a doll. So technically you are a toy. So shut the fuck up, you lying toy. Chucky's like, kid, I don't like you. And if your body's still alive up there in the coma, when we get out of here, I'm going right in. Chucky's going to be a bro. I said it once before and I'll say it again. Clive goes, I'd like to see you try, you little fucking doll. I'll fucking beat your ass right now. And Chucky's like beating, <laughs> Clive's just beating Chucky's ass. Just like wailing on him. And Chucky can't do shit. He's a fucking doll. But Clive gets pulled off by Freddy and Freddy's like, we still need him. Yes, Clive is Southern. Uh, he's from Louisiana. But so I'm doing his voice wrong because I'm trying to do, I guess I did like a half-ass black guy voice. But he's not. He's not my impression of him. He's whatever brilliant actor we got. Uh, so, 
they realize that there's some sort of ball going on in hell where everyone is gathering in the main city on hell. But banners have unfurled around the city featuring Freddy, Jason, and Chucky, and Clive as like wanted posters. It's a total fantasy movie. It's almost like a Star Wars movie. Okay, back in the hospital, our girl, Liv, she fucking cuts her way through three of the cultists and manages to get Clive in the bed he's in out of the room. So now they're pushing around a gurney with an unconscious guy in it in a hospital filled with panicking patients, trigger happy police officers, cult members, and Michael Myers. So just imagine if I don't lean into that part of the plot a lot in the next four minutes or so, that that is what's happening in cutaways in the movie. The marketing of it and everything would lean into that. You know, you'd have, I, I wanted the poster uh, to be the kid, Clive, sitting on like a throne made of bones and then Chucky sitting on his lap and uh, in a jester hat and uh, Freddy sort of in like Freddy colored robes whispering in his ear, kind of like Varys or like Peter Baelish. And then behind the throne, like the Hound or the Mountain, Jason with like a really cool stylized hockey mask and below it, it just says, go to hell. I mean, like, there's no way that movie isn't a hit. It could suck. They could do like a bad job and everyone would still be like, well, this looks cool. Especially after this next part, Clive becomes aware that the reason there's this big congregation of demons gathering at this massive ballroom in the center of the city of Dis is because a demonic invasion of Earth is about to occur. Clive realizes it's his body that's going to be sacrificed to start the demonic invasion. It must have something to do with this cube, but what does it mean? The devils here in hell don't look like the thing that attacked them at Crystal Lake. All those chains and metal, what does it mean? Clive found it strangely beautiful, hypnotic even. He plays with the cube again, but he can't get it to open like it did before. He doesn't understand. Freddy is like still fucked up from finding out he's wrongfully accused, except for he has like murdered hundreds of people. Like, like, so he's having a whole, he's on one. Chucky is like on outs with the group, but is there by obligation because he doesn't want to separate from them and get caught. And Jason just is trying to like keep everyone together and keeps patting Freddy. And he goes, you were a nice man. And Freddy, shut the fuck up. You know what? He hates it. So Clyde is like, we have to get inside that ball. So they start to like look for people they can assume the identity of. Freddy sees someone going in and has Jason grab Warwick Davis, the leprechaun from the leprechaun movies, out of the crowd, cut his head off. Of course, that doesn't permanently kill him, but he then throws the head and the body off a cliff and takes his clothes. Chucky is now dressed as the leprechaun from Leprechaun. Jason, looking into the crowd, Freddy goes, that guy, it's Leatherface. Jason gets behind Leatherface, boom, claw to the face. Clive takes out his legs. Jason fucking cuts him in half. Jason throws the halves off the cliff. It's a psych gag we do three times, you know, rule of three. So he throws Leatherface off the cliff. You now have Jason dressed as Leatherface. So it just, again, these are toys and skins for the video game and possible Halloween costumes, Jason as Leatherface. And then finally, Clive and Freddy are looking for someone and they see like a flock of screams of the killer from Scream. There's just a flock of them. So both of them put attack those guys and put on their costumes. So there's two Scream ghosts, Leatherface and the Leprechaun, and they head into the ball in hell. Yeah. it's This movie's like silly and fun. You could have Jason go, ew, when he puts the flesh face on. A Lord and Miller style quick cut of Chucky and Jason trying to hold, or Chucky and Freddy trying to hold Jason still, and Clyde going, "We're just gonna put this over your face," and Jason going, "No, like that." And then they put the leather face on him, and Jason goes, "Ooh, okay." In the ball in hell, we're in the Ready Player One zone. Samara, Candyman. Pumpkinhead Demon, The Puppet Master Puppets, The Driller Killer, Maniac Cop, The Toxic Avenger, everybody, every 80s iconic monster who is not an alien is up in this shit. This scene is not in any of the trailers. Maybe you see a glimpse of it and we hide the fact that this happens in the movie at all. So when you witness this as you're watching the movie, if you didn't read the spoilers, you'll be like, how did they get the rights to all these characters? Except for most of those rights are cheap as shit. 
and would be really happy to be involved in a project this big. It's so incredible we got the right. Anyway, so it's everyone. It's every iconic bad guy. It's the bad guys from Nightbreed. It's the vampires from Near Dark. It's everyone. It's the werewolf from American Werewolf is in there. You know, it's every single monster. And like, it's one of those posters you buy at a convention with all the monsters on it. It's that. Clive, as he goes in, realizes that even though there's like a big, like sort of legend Tim Curry Satan sitting on a throne, Clive is like, this is bullshit, man. Something's weird about this. Freddie is like, yeah, I'm getting that too. By the way, Scream costume, Freddie glove, buy the figure. Where does Halloween costume? What? It's so cool. Anyway, so they sneak in and everybody is like meeting each other. It's totally crazy. Of course, the shocker is there. Who else is there? The Dust Till Dawn vampires, yes. The villains from Scanners, yes. Candyman, yes, of course. How could he not be? You know who else is there? The Bye Bye Man. The Bye Bye Man is there. No big deal. We got the Bye Bye Man. Like, I want everybody. I want it to be like the whole squad. Yeah, Wishmaster is there. Christine is there. That would be fucking sick. Gotta have Christine. Jeepers Creepers is definitely there. I'm so close to finishing this, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna power through. Oh, and Clive called bullshit on the ball. He sneaks up behind the throne and sees that on the back of the devil's throne, there is a giant lattice symbol. It's all these geometric symbols. And Clive realizes those are the same ones on the fucking cube. Clive's like, this is how they sacrificed me. He goes out in front of the devil, in front of all the monsters of hell, tips over this giant fucking thing of fire. And he goes, oh, you listen to me. You're being fooled. This is not the devil. I love Clive so much. And Freddie is like, uh, Chucky is like, I'm not with him. Jason is like, that's not the devil. This is not the devil. This is a fake. The Tim Curry devil stands up. A big Satan, like in a movie. Clive goes, Fuck you, man, I'm not scared of you. And holds up the cube and he goes, this is where the real power is. You're all sacrifices, he tricked you. He brought you here to sacrifice you just like they sacrificed me. The big devil goes, kill him. Every monster in the entire horror pantheon versus Freddy, Jason and Chucky and Clive, except for Clive, this time when it says kill him, he goes, fuck you, I don't die like that and presses in the cube. Clive's whole arm goes white and chains go bursting out of his wrist. He's ah! like that, they attack him and he's getting thrown around by his own arm during this giant fight. It's a Marvel movie. So Samara from the ring, it's Candyman versus Freddy. It's everything you want. It's everything you want in this scene. It's every single thing you would want to happen. I would do everything. Just over deliver out the ass until finally Clive is able to control the chains in his arm and fucking starts wiping out half of the fucking slashers. Now keep in mind, being killed doesn't kill you here, but it does like take you out. So he is taking fools out. We are seeing like pumpkin head gets torn in half. It's fucking sick. Clive eventually kills the devil only for the devil to go, I suppose it could only last so long. Hell comes crashing down around them into geometric shapes and a maze that goes on forever. It's Pinhead from Hellraiser. This hell was just a comforting illusion, something to show you all, something you'd know before you arrived. The only lost souls, the only truly lost souls, were brought to me by divine providence. Hey, that's true. Chucky kept getting thrown out of the deeper layer of hell. Jason is trapped in the lake until he respawns and Freddy was trapped in the dreamscape. None of them would have ever been to hell. That means Clive and this whole journey has played directly into the hands of a monster so much more dangerous than the devil. The lament configuration. Extremity of experience embodied in living creatures, the Cenobites, not quite dead, not quite alive, but ever in pain and forever in pleasure. Clive Barker's Hellraiser are the antagonists.
of this movie. Up with the cult, guess what? Liv manages to drop Michael Myers down an elevator shaft. Wouldn't you know, we lose one of our kids, we kill one of the cult members, but now his body is starting to flatline. Our dude is about to be torn apart. You know, the classic thing where all of the chains get you. Except for as he's being torn apart, Pinhead says, and you were sent here as the sacrifice. And Clive realizes, no, I wasn't. I wasn't sent here. The old guard said you can't send someone to hell. I arrived here on my own. I was brought here after they poisoned me. I went into the dreamscape. Then I went into the bardo. Then I went into the factory that was made for Chucky at the gates of hell. And then I went into hell. I wasn't sent here as a sacrifice. You were sent here as a sacrifice. I'm the one with the cube. And Pinhead goes, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know what? Whoops. Clive tears Pinhead apart. But all of the Cenobites now converge on them as hell falls apart. All of the other slasher killers fall into darkness. Freddy, Jason, and Chucky are dangling on each other, holding on as hell descends into geometric shapes. It's like a final level in a video game. Chains flying everywhere. Pinhead is not going down that easy. In the fucking hospital, Michael Myers is like chasing Liv, chasing Liv. The, the Smiths are chasing Liv. It's getting more and more intense. Drama, action, drama. Clive realizes he grabs Pinhead. He's all fucked up. But now Clive, as he grabs Pinhead, all the pins go onto Clive's face. And we realize, hey, we finally have a modern, iconic black slasher killer. Thank you. Let's get in on it. It's Pinhead, and he's black, and he's an anti-hero. I'm turning it. It's all backwards now, even though he looks white. It's cool. Uh, so Pinhead's like, fuck. Clive opens him. They need a portal to, from the dead world to the living world. The cult has been trying to summon demons. Out of it comes Clive, pissed off. Chain through cultists, left, right, left, right, left, right. Michael Myers turns around, stabs Clive, starts to drive him back into the portal into hell. Surprise, bitch, it's Jason. Jason versus Michael. You've been waiting for it. You've got it. Guess what? It's not a fight. Bam, 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 bam. Super brutal hits. And then Michael gets Jason and goes to slit his throat. His hand is caught. By Freddy, who's halfway out of the hell portal. Stabs Michael in the chest. Michael turns and stabs Freddy in the chest. Freddy falls down out of the hell portal. Clive grabs Freddy and picks him up. Chains at Michael Myers. Michael Myers is like, whoa, totally overwhelmed. Backwards, backwards. Freddy is trying to get Jason before Jason gets dragged with Michael Myers back into the hell portal. Chucky jumps up onto Michael Myers' back as Michael Myers grabs the real body of, you know, there's still the body of, there's Cenobite Clive and normal Clive. As Michael Myers grabs the body, as he's pulled back into hell, Chucky jumps on him from behind and rips Michael Myers' mask halfway off so we full on see his face. And Chucky stabs a knife into the side of his head. Michael Myers, of course, is Michael Myers, so he just goes and grabs Chucky by the throat. And Chucky goes, kid! You deserve this, I don't. Come back for me. Pulls Michael, they fall into hell. The gateway closes. The cultists are now alone with Freddy who's on the floor with a stab wound. Freddy's mortal right now. Jason Voorhees and Clive, a Cenobite. Liv is like looking at Clive's body, looking at the demon, looking at Clive's body, looking at the demon. Clive looks at Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And he goes, was this what you wanted? because this is how it worked out. Mr. Smith goes, please, we're nice people. Freddy, boom, through the back, not through the brain, through the mouth, claws. And then he pulls them up through the guy's head, watermelon. Miss Smith goes, he made me do everything. I, I didn't do any of, Jason, boom, head off. <laughs> Two other cultists turn to try to run. Liv shoots one of them and one of them gets a chain through the spine. Clive realizes he needs to go back into his body. 
So he goes back into his body, but he keeps the cube. The police breach the hospital. Jason leaves, basically escapes. It has a moment where he escapes into the sewer, but Freddy looks like a normal guy and doesn't have the burns, but he has a stab wound from the same type of knife as everyone in the, else in the hospital. So Freddy is basically taken by Jason out into the world for the sequel. Oh, none of this is permanent. I'm not gonna leave Freddy as a normal guy. Like... So the end of the movie is basically our boy gets adopted by the cute family, but then of course Liv has broken out to go visit him and they go and he's like, I'm glad you're here. She's like, why? And he's like, because you know I got to go back. She's like, what? And he's like, I got to go back for Chucky. And Freddie comes out of the woods and now he looks cool as shit because it's just the actor we have who plays Freddie, but he has the hat, but he just looks great. You know, just like he's recovered from the stab wound. She's like, you're going to go back to hell? Clive goes, I know this may shock you, but I'm not a good person. And I don't think you are either. He holds out the cube to live. He goes, come to hell with me. Make a deal with the devil. She takes the cube and she starts to turn white. Movie's done. So the sequel is, of course, getting Chucky out of hell and visiting 80s action villains in hell and all sorts of other cool things. Hannibal Lecter is in that one. And then the third one is Hell on Earth, is uh, basically all of the modern it would be whatever we could get the rights to, whatever big bad from a modern movie, although there aren't any real good ones that we could get the rights to. So that's my pitch for Hellbound. I'm proud of it. I think it's good. It wasn't fanfic. I almost sold that. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy that I almost got that to exist? Just like, yeah, the perfect way to close out the 80s boom. That was exactly what I wanted to do. And it, when I first started pitching, it was 2016. Retro is big in right now. I want to murder it. I want to do retro modern. I want to do the 80s movies as Pirates of the Caribbean. I want to do the slasher movies as Pirates of the Caribbean in hell are rated. And it just, it didn't feel like in 2016, it really felt like a can't miss thing, you know? Oh, I forgot. I forgot an important thing, which is that Chucky, when he first has the opportunity to leave hell, he says he can't leave hell because they keep catching him. But then we find out the reason he won't leave hell is because of Tiffany is because he's staying because he needs to get Tiffany out and he's in love with her. And that's sort of how he gets back in good with the group. He's hiding that. And then Clive figures it out because he sees that Tiffany is being held hostage by the big demon. Clive goes, why don't you do something about that? Be a man. Chucky goes, I'm a doll. You said it yourself. If I went up there, they would just kill me. And I get sent back. He can't hurt her. She'll suffer and suffer. I already killed her. Like that. And you're like, well, I can't really argue with that reasoning. Wow, they have a very toxic relationship. But he's not wrong. I mean, she's, it's not like Tiffany's cool, you know? It's not like Tiffany's an okay person. So, like, they kind of deserve each other. 